Greetings everyone and once again, happy 2011. Welcome to the Feminine Mojo Show here on Blog Talk Radio. I'm your host, Jamie Walters. I'm an author and the creatrix of IVC and the Feminine Mojo Projects. You'll find more information and inspiration on the Feminine Mojo Projects, of which this Blog Talk Radio Show is one, but not the only one. And you'll find information on how you can use and work with the Feminine Mojo Projects or participate and reclaim your own feminine mojo. Learn more about that and more at IVYSEA.com, and I'll tell you more about that later as well. As we continue into 2011, this new calendar year anyway that we've just begun, and every day is a new start as we know, every moment is a new start potentially to change our minds, to change our hearts. But since we've just started a new calendar year, we'll work with it. So that as we've started this 2011 year, We'll, and as we look forward, we'll have continued opportunities to navigate change and transformation. And the coming year also offers some amazing possibilities, as all days and all years do, and some more than others, to align with the wisdom and power of our hearts and the deep, deep wisdom we have access to. So it's even more important for each one of us to be in strong relationship with the feminine and the deep wisdom that's been too long forgotten. And that's, uh, among other things, what the Feminine Mojo Projects have been conceived for, as a contribution for, as a vessel for. Join me in the Feminine Mojo Mystery School, another of the Feminine Mojo Projects, to explore the feminine more deeply if you choose, if you feel comfortable. Over the coming year, we'll explore powerful feminine and goddess stories and archetypes and the seven gates of Inanna, which provide one journey map of initiation and transformation You'll find that and other Feminine Mojo resources, again, at IVYSEA.com. Now, for today's Feminine Mojo's Inspired Dialogue, John Lamb uh, joins me again. We talked a couple of weeks ago, and today we'll be talking about the return of Sophia, the great goddess, and why the wisdom from the ancient mystery schools is so important to us right now. In today's conversation, we'll explore the role of desire, our divine endowment, gender balance, and gender love, and the organic light that some of the ancient mystery teachers were very familiar with. And we've been kind of uh, distracted a little bit from that part of our endowment and that part of our history. We'll also learn how Mary Magdalene fits into this picture. So listen in, and it'll be a great conversation. We'll be talking for about 90 minutes this time. We've got a lot to share. So settle in, sit back, pour yourself a cup of tea if you haven't already, and um, join us. John Lamb Lash is the author of one of my favorite books, as I mentioned last time and I've mentioned on my blog, Not in His Image, Gnostic Vision, Sacred Ecology, and the Future of Belief. If you followed my Sophia's Children blog or listened to the recent conversation with John on the most recent Feminine Mojo show, you'll know this is a must-read book. And um, I've read it several times. I refer back to it several times. My copy, at least the working copy, is dog-eared and underlined. So um, you'll also find John on Sophia returning the Path to Planetary Tantra DVD, and you'll find that at sacredmysteries.com. John Lash is often called the, the true successor of Marcia Eliade and the rightful heir of Joseph Campbell. He's a self-educated independent scholar who combines studies and experimental mysticism to teach directive mythology. That is, as he says, the application of myth to life rather than its mere in- interpretation. He's also authored The Seeker's Handbook, Twins and the Double, The Hero, Manhood and Power, and Quest for the Zodiac. You'll find more about John Lamb Lash at his website, metahistory.org. Welcome back to the Feminine Mojo Show, John. Well, thank you, Jamie. It's beautiful introduction. (laughs) Thanks. Yeah, there's, there's a lot to work with, and that's always really wonderful. So before we, we dive into the mysteries, or uh, this is actually kind of a part of it, um, because certainly reacquainting ourselves with the cycles and rhythms of nature and the goddess archetypes is um, so much part of the rich heritage that we're reclaiming. But uh, today you would mentioned is the, the full moon of Kali, where we're connecting and talking and having this conversation on the day of the full moon in Cancer in Western astrology. But you talked about it being the full moon of Kali and the most magical full moon of the year. That sounds delightful. Can you uh, speak a little bit more about that and share it with our listeners? Certainly, I'd be delighted. It's my understanding to the study of the sky for many years, to the study of the real sky constellations, the observable sky, and the patterns of the moon and planets through these constellations. 
that the sky represents a kind of code through which we can read the intentions and activities of divine entities. Of course, this is a very ancient idea. But what I find wonderful and exciting is that we can rediscover and apply this idea in our time. Mm-hmm. I have attempted to do this to a great extent, as you know, through my website and through the years I've also, I guess you could say, tutored and mentored people in observation of the real sky. For instance, observation of the crescent moon uh, mm-hmm. each month. And to connect yourself in will and intention and in desire and love with those cycles, especially the lunar cycles, is a way to become integrated into the divine mysteries of the universe and to a way also to discover and uh, activate, actualize our own divine endowment. So Mm -hmm. I've taught a great deal about these lunar cycles, and I just want to say that consequent of the previous new moon uh, of about two weeks ago that precedes the full moon, uh, we are in the full moon of Kali, of Kali, Mahakali, or Kali Ma. And this is a, an aspect of the divine feminine that can be viewed as having a really important role today in what we are facing in the world. Mm-hmm. Those of us who would like to, to reconnect with Gaia and who feel the, the longing and the powerful, powerful longing, I, I don't know of a better word for it, the, the craving to reconnect with the matrix of the life force, mm-hmm. you know, are also aware, acutely aware, that there is something wrong in our world and that the way that human society lives on the planetary level is not in accord with the life force of the divine goddess. So we find ourselves in some respect, in a, we may find ourselves on the planet today in a conflictual situation. That is to say that the earth is not a safe and happy place as we would like it to be. Mm-hmm. And so to a certain extent, those of us who follow the way of Gaia and of the goddess must become warriors to establish that true way of life. It's a warrior calling. And Kali, if I, how would I define her to you in, in a simple phrase from my understanding? <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes things are so intimate that it's difficult to speak of them. Um, and this is certainly how I feel about my connection with Kali. Mm-hmm. It's yes, she doesn't. Uh, many of these things don't lend themselves well to that 30 second elevator blurb we've <laughs> been so accustomed to with just the sound no, they bite, don't. So. They don't. But at the same time, it is important to be clear and to be cogent in, in how we communicate about these things. So I'd like to say that for those of you who are drawn toward the divine feminine, those of you who recognize that the presence of the earth, the presence, of the earth is a divine, super intelligent, super animating organism. With recognizing Kali, kind of the immunological system of that organism. So I might use that metaphor. Mm-hmm. This is why she is called the highest of all protectors. She's a great, great protector of those who would now return to Gaia and who would now enjoy and celebrate and explore and enact the mysteries of our divine potential. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because as I've been listening, it just occurred to me that I think it was January 12th to the 19th, so this would be the last day of um, one of the festivals in India um, for... Parvati, which sometimes is um, talked of as being just another name or face of Kali and Durga. So still, you know, it's re- right. it really is talking about that fierce feminine aspect that can hold the, um, the intense desire and loving and creativity with that kind of fierceness that probably has long been feared in the, the so-called dark feminine. 
That's right. And uh, I would say that the, the, insofar as we look at the situation of the world today and we look at the things that are wrong and the things that are deliberately uh, made to go wrong, mm-hmm. by the way, you know, the orchestrations of deception yeah. and control, it's all coming from a paternal and patriarchal viewpoint that is terrified of the feminine. Mm-hmm. Terrified. And those of us who reconnect with the divine goddess and Gaia and the mother, who is Mother Earth, uh, Sophia, as the Gnostic culture, of mm-hmm. course we recognize her nurturing qualities. Of course we recognize that she gives life and sustains life. But at the same time, Jamie, there is that factor of mm-hmm. yoga, the invincible, the ferocious, and this is the Kali factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really rich myth, and it's um, definitely one of the ones that I explore pretty regularly because as we were talking about just before we started the show, John, both of us seem uh, fairly well um, acquainted with Kali, or at least Kali has made sure that we're well acquainted with her and in conversation with her under various yes, degrees. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, so, and it is a really rich, rich story, but the whole point of these stories, as we'll, and we'll be talking about some of them um, in just a few moments, but it's not just sort of uh, an exercise in entertainment, you know, or I forget what, I recently saw kind of a, a term for spiritual entertainment, but kind of spiritainment. But it, it really is as we explore or re-explore these stories, as we lift off the, um, the kind of patriarchal distortion or patriarchal overlay, we begin to find our way back. You know, it's almost like ancient tributaries meandering back, and, and it really does activate a type of cellular or ancestral or what is it, analeptic memory um, of, of some of this deeper wisdom. So it's, it seems to me both really enjoyable. It's a joyful pursuit to reacquaint with these stories, to immerse in them and, and explore them. But it also um, continually amazes me at what it awakens, you know, just kind of step by step, dream by dream, you know. It's one of those kind of things as it unfolds. But it, I'm always in awe of it, John. I, I'm sure that's the case with you as well. I couldn't agree with you more, Jamie. You know, the, the encounter with the divine feminine is not a game. It's not an entertainment. It's not a union uh, exercise of playing with mm-hmm. psychic uh, signifiers and correspondences. It's a tremendous adventure and it's extremely exciting. It engages the entirety of your life. And uh, I can speak from one who was, who has been held, if I might use this phrase, held in the bosom of Kali since I was four years old. I can, <laughs> I can assure you <laughs> that when she comes into your life, she comes with a shattering, shattering effect. But she yeah. only shatters your illusions. She only shatters the things that hold you back from everything that you have in yourself that is of the divine endowment, that everything that is of our true divinity and the power of our imagination, our desire. Mm-hmm. She only holds, she only shatters those things, but she is shattering. She has a knife and she uses it well. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's exactly what has been most feared, and that's actually a really great. So here we are under the uh, the full moon and full moon the, the light. Uh, yeah, that's right. The the full moon of Kali shining down and shining within us, and and as we dive into this conversation. So uh, what you just said actually uh, leads, leads us perfectly, John. At first, um, in talking about you know as we've just said kind of exploring some of these stories, finding our way back, you know, unwinding that, um, you know, it's like a, I kind of see a, a ball of yarn that's been all, you know, knotted and twisted and tangled. So as we kind of untangle this, we look at some of the ancient stories. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, you don't just don't go don't think of the past or it's over now or that's kind of a long way off you know what could that possibly hold for us now but in the case of the mysteries as in the case of of uh, much of the wisdom there's a great deal 
that's relevant, you know, that kind of timeless right. wisdom that's very, very relevant to us now. So would you talk just a bit to get us started on why the mysteries matter to us today? Why is it so important right now at this juncture in our personal and collective experience? Certainly, this is, this is such a key question. Uh, it's true that the mysteries were an organization of people and a network of spiritual universities and uh, cells of practitioners of shamanism and mysticism in the past. That's what they were, if you would define them in historical terms. And so in order to know what the mysteries were, we have to turn our gaze toward the past because that is when they existed in their full-blown uh, maturity in the actually thousands of years prior to the Christian era they existed. And this is something worth knowing about simply because it's such an enormous part of the biography of our species. So on that account alone, it would be worth looking into the mysteries. And I, I encourage everyone to... to read my book for the, the, the picture that it presents of the mysteries, which mm -hmm. I don't believe you'll find uh, in any other particular source. But you're absolutely right, Jamie. The, the point now that humanity faces is very critical, and we can't spend too much time looking back, and we certainly cannot fall under the illusion that uh, going back is going to solve where we are today. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I would say that if you have some understanding of what the mysteries were, the Sophianic mysteries of Gnosticism mm -hmm. in particular, then you will be able to understand the solution for today, the solution for humanity's dilemma, for many of the problems we're facing, spiritual, social, economic, political, whatever. And if I were asked to put it in one cogent phrase about why the mysteries matter today is because they bring us back to connection with our divine potential. That is why they matter so much. Mm -hmm. And they end um, very often, if, as you have done, John, both in, in various of your writings on metahistory.org and in Not in His Image and... I would assume um, the Sophia returning DVD, I haven't yet seen that, but um, mm -hmm. you really, they really do, those teachings really do give us clues. And we broached this a little bit in our last conversation, the first part of this conversation a couple of weeks ago, in talking a little bit about the Sophia myth and um, the story and the, the role of some of the influences, if you want to call them the archontic influences, that um, can lead us astray and what, the part, what part they played in that story, if you will. Sure. And so, you know, some of the things that we'll be talking about today continue on that discussion of the teachings of the mysteries, which you've, um, I mean, in my mind and many others, you know, really beautifully put together and explore and present in the book and in the writings on metahistory. But... Um, this whole idea of the Sophia myth and the, the importance of desire, for example, and this whole idea that we have an, an, uh, a divine endowment, and that includes particular gifts, which you mentioned a little earlier, the imagination, the, the intention, right. you know, desire That's being right. one. But, you know, desire That's is right. one of those, desire is one of those things and amongst this divine endowment that um, provide us with um, warrior tools, if you will, spiritual warrior tools, feminine spiritual warrior tools um, that really can allow us to look differently, to have that shift of heart, shift of mind, shift of perception um, in a very lived and engaged and experienced way as we kind of approach these issues and these things in our world now. But, you know, when I think of de desire, John, I think of so often along my own spiritual path and as a student of different spiritual traditions and engaged in practice in several for quite a while, it so often desire, passion, emotion, feeling are presented as... Um, 
unconscious, something that's lower, things that are, are to be transcended. Right. And I right. found, you know, over the last couple years particularly, as I've kind of taken a different loop on the spiral with um, the Divine Feminine, that that has, I've, I've found myself increasingly impatient with that. It really ticks me off. <laughs> You know, but it, you know. So it. say a little bit about that because we've really, I think, either in a in a subtle way or very very overtly, we've heard desire is bad, passion is bad, emotion to feel deeply is bad. You need to transcend that. It needs to be this sort of pacific, um, you know, mental state, this peaceful, right. you know, where you're always right. unrippled. And that seems kind of uh, maybe not so helpful to me. Can you speak more about desire and this whole bad rap it's gotten? Well, you know, desire is, is uh, an extremely problematical issue. Uh, and to have clarity about desire is one of the key factors in enlightenment, in mm -hmm. my understanding. Is the problem with desire is that it's sort of like been played bad on both sides of the fence. Mm -hmm. now, on the one hand, we're told by certain spiritual teachings that desire is bad. Uh, you should, it only leads to frustration. It only leads to uh, uh, to selfish gratifications, which will not fulfill you, and therefore you should abandon desire. On the other hand, our culture tells us that desire, your narcissistic desires, are all that counts. That's right. And so we're kind of buffeted between these two extremes, you know, the kind of spiritual extreme which says you have to transcend desire to realize blah, blah, blah in a spiritual way. And the materialistic side that says, no, 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 every, you can have everything you want, the porch, the house, the fame, you know, the man, the woman, whatever, and go for it. And we're continually buffeted back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. It, 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 between these two extremes, the way forward is to cut completely through both of those extremes. Neither of those is true. They are both falsifications. It's mm -hmm. neither the abandonment of our desire nor the narcissistic and selfish attainment of our desire. It is the transpersonal attainment of your desire. That is the, that is the key, the transpersonal attainment. Now, what is the transpersonal achievement of the desire? I'd like to introduce this concept in this conversation in the context of what we're discussing right now. But what I mean by the transpersonal aspect of your desire is this. Have you ever considered that this most powerful desire that you hold in your body in your soul, in your emotions, that you may not even yet have defined for yourself. But have you considered that that desire, if you could define it, would connect you with a transpersonal and divine engagement? Mm -hmm. That's the real key. So the idea that there is a transpersonal element in desire, in true and pure desire, you see, a lot of desires we have are not are really our own. I mean, look at the world. Look at we're encouraged. Look at what we are encouraged to desire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Cars. Yeah, and I mean, right? and, and, and never be satisfied with anything. I and mean, oh, and it's satisfied. you know, neuro manipulation through advertising. It's, it's, you know, to always have people in this state of unsatisfied want. That's right. There's a tremendous mm -hmm. manipulation of the human species around desire, and if you recognize how effective that manipulation is and how much it, uh, it drives the, 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 the stupid and ridiculous aspects of our society, then you can also recognize the counterpart. Just imagine if we could harness the true force of our desire, our heart's desire, mm -hmm. and that it would connect us to something transpersonal and divine. That would be the higher calling the higher aspect of desire which I have uh, attempted to uh, to develop in, in planetary tantra and some of the uh, the messages that I've been developing since I wrote my book 
When you and, and when we're talking about this um, heart's desire that connects us to something transpersonal, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it probably you know the, what's being manipulated that oh this will satisfy your desire this car this person you know this thing that you're never going right. to be satisfied with because you know you have to perpetually be on this machine we've got you on always looking looking looking, but and you um, have to buy the product that, that, that is going to support that. <laughs> <laughs> right? it's oh, it's like yeah. Placement. Yeah, it really is. Uh, there is so it's pretty much amazing. Product. But the impulse it really itself, is. the impulse itself, John, it's, I mean, even though it's being manipulated, underneath that is a real desire that's seeking to be um, heard, connected to, expressed. You know, and that's what that's you're right. talking about with the heart's, with the heart's desire. You know, to, to, right. to, it's almost like, you know, I think of Goethe's poem, The Holy Longing. You know that phrase, mm-hmm. the holy longing, this this longing. Beautiful phrase. Yeah. Beautiful phrase, yeah. Let me see if I could offer this analogy. How are human beings different from other animals in nature, like whales, bees, lions, uh, lizards, iguanas, uh, you name it? How are we different from other animals? Well, when you look at other animals in Gaia's menagerie, you know, here's Gaia's menagerie of animals. Here's the human species and all the other species, plants and animals. <laughs> when you look at the other animals in Gaia's menagerie, like whales or bees or butterflies or uh, uh, leopards or elephants, you find that they have an instinctual program that, do, that directs their life. And they are guided by that program. So elephants behave in a certain way. Dolphins behave in a certain way. Monarch butterflies behave in a certain way. Because Gaia, the mother animal, has endowed them with an instinctual program for their betterment so that they can thrive, so that they can survive. And what is beautiful about these other animal species is that they remain within the parameters of their given instinctual program. So some of us who have the humility to look at nature and realize that we are not superior to nature, that we can learn a lot from it, recognize the beauty and the intelligence and the wisdom in these instinctual programs of these insects and reptiles and birds and animals. We recognize the wisdom, Sophia being the name of wisdom, that Sophia has endowed her wisdom in these animals so that they live and thrive and cooperate together to form this paradise of the biosphere. Now I ask you to look at the human being, Mm -hmm. the human creature, and I ask you to consider the question, well, how are we different? Well, I think it's immediately obvious that we're different in this respect, that we don't have a predefined instinctual program to follow. We are given by Gaia an enormous amount of latitude and play. You know, there is no other mammal, mammalian species, that can live in every part of the earth. We can live in the tropics, in the mountains, in the desert, by the ocean, by the coast. But all the other species are adapted to a very limited environment. They can only live in a particular environment. So we are given by Gaia herself, by the wisdom of the goddess, a tremendous latitude to play and explore. That's what makes our species so exceptional, not superior. Mm -hmm. Exceptional. Right. I, I like that. That, that distinction is wonderful. Not superior, it's but exceptional. Yeah. And, Jamie, that's also what makes our species dangerous. Because mm-hmm. if we have that latitude of play and exploration, then we can deviate vastly from the designs of the biological harmony of nature. That is the risk that Gaia took with us. She took a fantastic risk with the human species. Now, if you can just keep this conception on board for a moment, bring your attention back 
is the concept of desire. I would like to convey an entirely new understanding of what desire is. Given that we are the species in Gaia's menagerie that has the greatest latitude of play and exploration, given that we are the species that is not confined and restricted to an instinctual program, how are we going to define our own program? Mm -hmm. That's the question. How are we going to define the program the behavioral and evolution, evolutionary program of the human species that will merge and thrive with the general plan of all species. Mm -hmm. We're not here to dominate all species. We're not here to massacre all species, which unfortunately we have attempted to do. You know? Yeah. Suppose that we are here to, co to coexist and thrive with all species. In order to do that, in Gaia's conception, we would have to have a lodestone or touchstone for our own instinctual program. And that touchstone is desire. Mm -hmm. And what are we desiring? Because I know that, man, I know that people listening would ask just that. You know, well, I desire this right. or I desire that. So in this way, what are we desiring? Okay, what are we desiring? What do you desire? What do you want in life? I would ask you to consider this exercise. Make an inventory of your desires. Sit down with a piece of paper and write A, B, C, D, E, the things that you desire. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you made a list. And then ask yourself, Okay, what is my highest desire? This is the operative syntax. And this is syntax that comes from the Dakini realm, by the way. What is my highest desire? You know, I've asked this question to quite a number of people over the last few years. What is your highest desire? The highest desire of your life, right now. And you know what answer I get, Jamie? What? Yeah. They can't answer that because they don't know. They don't know. Yeah. I, I, I'm not so, surprised at all by that. I'm not surprised by, you, at all by that. Do you see that? Do you see that? And this is so crucial because the fact is we are told that we ought to desire these things. Mm -hmm. We are told that we ought to desire so many things. And we are educated and told by our parents and told by movies and told by novels and told by all of these external sources, and I implore you to ask yourself, what is your highest desire spoken from your own heart? Mm -hmm. When you know that, and when you connect with that, you connect with Gaia in the unique way that human beings are designed to do. She wants us to realize our highest desires. She wants us to be fulfilled and to thrive, but we must know what our true desire is. And we must not be deluded and distracted by all of these fallacious and specious mm. desires that are uh, forced upon us. That's why desire is a test. You could say in a sense, Jamie, that knowing your true desire is a test, mm -hmm. a test of entry into interactivity with the goddess. I don't know if that yeah, makes any sense to you, but I'm just putting it out as I, as I understand it. Yeah, it makes perfectly good sense. And, and you know, that's how, that's, those are, um, sometimes I call them dangerous prayers, you know, those powerful, powerful questions that just by asking, we open ourselves up to a completely different um, experience, you know, one that wants to initiate us into a greater awareness. So, and the beauty of this question, and that, you know, it, it is difficult for so many of us to answer, you know, what is my highest desire for so many reasons. Um, we're taught, yes, to desire so many other things. We're told what to desire, and we're also told that 
what we can't desire, <laughs> you know, in a strange way. But the beauty of it is, John, for me, it's like real key, you know, learning to love the questions themselves. So the, we can start there. That's the prayer. That's right. That's the inquiry. Okay. What is my highest desire? Lucas Q is so important, you know, live the question. And in this case, live the question, what is your highest desire? Uh, if I would speak to you from the absolute essence of my heart and the, the experiences that I have had in the last three or four years that have brought me into such uh, an intimacy with the divine presence of the earth, I would say that this question has been the, the most important factor to mm -hmm. ask myself, what is my highest desire? And when you break through, it will take you to a breakthrough if you ask that question. It will. And that breakthrough will lead you to an, a sublime understanding, which is so exciting and so liberating. And the understanding is that what you want for your life is also what she wants for her mm -hmm. life. Beautiful. Beautiful. And um, this, I mean, I, I honestly think we could probably keep talking about this alone um, for the next 60 minutes because it's such an, an important exploration and it's a portal, as you've said, you know, this question and knowing this. Um, but I want to just um, continue for a little bit, knowing that this uh, idea of desire will no doubt or may no doubt weave itself um, through our conversation. But, um, you know, mm -hmm. desire, as you've said, John, is one of... Um, a number, and perhaps this most important one, what is my ho highest desire, but it's one of several gifts or part of a divine endowment, if you will, that um, right. we are gifted with from Sophia, you know, our divine mother. And, um, right. and this idea of a divine endowment, um, you know, maybe it's what the theologian Matthew Fox um, called quite... Um, <laughs> in quite a rebellious or revolutionary way, the original blessings, you know, if you will. But so yeah. what are some what are some of the divine um what is part of what are the parts of this divine endowment? What are the gifts in addition to desire, or perhaps with desire foremost as you've talked about, what are some of the other divine gifts that are part of this endowment that are so important for us to realize and, and um maybe perhaps remember or reclaim consciously? Well, thanks for that, that question, Jamie, because it, it uh, gives me the opportunity to talk about uh, the mysteries again. Uh, what I would say about the mysteries that is so essential to our orientation today is this. The mysteries were a type of spiritual universities and training schools that were directed by shamans and seers. These shamans and seers of the ancient world, of ancient, uh, the Europe, ancient European world, uh, because that is historically where the mysteries were located, uh, in the Levant and Europe and uh, North Africa, uh, were men and women equally. It was a, the, the mystery tradition was a totally egalitarian system. Men and women shared equally in their responsibility uh, of these mystery schools. One of the wonderful things that you can come to understand about the mystery is that the people who directed those schools and founded and directed them had a profound understanding of what we would call today human potential. You know, that term has been popularized in the 60s, particularly connected with uh, Abraham Maslow. Maslow is a great, great pioneer and a great psychologist. And many of his concepts point to the metapsychology and spiritual education of the mystery schools. The mystery school teachers, who were men and women of equal uh, spiritual attainment, understood that we are all children of the earth. And we are all, the human species is the progeny of the mother of goddess, Sophia, who herself is embodied in the earth. And our mother, as they understood it, has endowed us with certain faculties. She has endowed us with gifts, with talents. And they recognized 
that there were basically seven kinds of talents. And the fantastic story of the mysteries is that they were, the, the mystery school teachers were the educators and teachers of the human race. Why were they educators and teachers? Simply because in the sense of Abraham Maslow, they understood human potential. They understood what actually is our divine potential, our divine endowment. Mm -hmm. And when students and individuals came to them, they endeavored to teach and cultivate that endowment in each person, one individual at a time. At a time. So it's a very beautiful model of education and spirituality. As you know, I present this model and I elaborate this in modern news image. That's really beautiful. Uh, you know, and you know, it also, um, John, there's such a sense of um, generosity, both in the original endowment of these blessings or gifts from Sophia, from our Divine Mother, and also with the mystery school teachers and others like them, you know, like you said, they endeavored to teach and cultivate these talents, you know, in each individual, one individual at a time they came to them, and and not in a, with a sense of hubris. In fact, there was quite a sense of reverence and humility um, for that particular privilege, if you will, of being able to access this wisdom to understand it and then to teach and cultivate it in those who came to them. I mean, that's, it's just such a beautiful generosity of spirit uh, to me. I love the way you express this, Jamie, because you're really capturing the essence of what it was. You know, there's a widespread, there are some very uh, erroneous and I won't say malicious, I just say there's a, a great deal of erroneous and misleading information about the mystery. Uh, being spread by certain people. And one of the, I, I won't go into that because we don't want to get into an adversarial conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a waste of time. But one of the points that I would uh, uh, indicate is this. It has been uh, suggested, in, sort of in the spirit of New Age spirituality, that initiates into the mysteries, it's experienced that they were gods and that it was a sense of God-like elevation. They saw themselves as gods. And uh, so uh, the rumor is, if I might say, that the purpose of initiation into the mysteries was to realize that we are gods. Mm -hmm. Well, I need to tell you that that was not the case at all. And what you have just said is far closer to the actual spirit of the mysteries than this rumor. In the mysteries, people underwent not glorification to a godlike status, not a sense of deification, or what Jung would, Jung would call uh, ego inflation. Mm -hmm. They underwent this ego death, ego death. And the end of your ego, the end of your separate sense of separation, mm -hmm. and the sense of immersion in a divine medium of love and wisdom and everlasting love. That was the ecstatic experience of Gnosis. You know, if you were, asked, if you were to ask me to define Gnosis, the Greek word for knowledge, in a single phrase, as the mystery school teachers understood it, Gnosis is cognitive ecstasy. It is the knowledge of cognition of those things which can only be known in ecstasy. Mm -hmm. But what kind of ecstasy am I talking about here, my friends? I'm not talking about the ecstasy of an inflation and glorification of yourself. On the contrary, as one who has had the privilege to undergo that ecstasy many times, I can tell you that it is exactly the opposite. It is the dissolution of your sense of ego and separation into a sublime unity of love and intelligence. And that is the base out of which these seers and initiates operated. And from that base of great humility, paradoxically, and, and, and please get me on this one, paradoxically, they were able to point to us 
our divine potential. Mm -hmm. Our divine potential doesn't exist in our identity that we think we're gods, that we glorify ourselves. No. Our divine potential consists in recognizing the gifts endowed in us by the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. And we recognize that in humility, and we share that recognition with generosity. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know what you're saying, too, is um, as I heard you say what you just said, John, it seemed to me again a real um, point of contrast that um, that recognition or realization of our divine endowment, the divine potential, in a sense of connection with Gaia, with Sophia, with life itself, has a right, very different right. way of presenting itself than the sort of... Um, <laughs> I'm a god, which is an ego base. So totally an ego base. You know, and right. then we can see that playing out around the world. You know, so those it we seems like two very different world. sorts of things. Yeah. That's right. So what no what were some of the? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Before we go into the, so the some of these it. wonderful talents. Sure, I will. I will list the endowments as I understand them. So before okay. I say that, I'm going to point out that the god complex is not a product of the mystery school of initiation. Please, if you understand anything that John Lash is trying to say in his mm -hmm. uh, presentation of the mystery, this is the essential point. The God complex is a psychotic breakdown of the human ego and a projection of the worst aspects of our character as a species. Yeah. And if you don't see that every day in what's happening in the world, then you got blinders on, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the mystery and, school, right, go ahead, Jamie. Oh, I was just going to say, and that actually leads us away from the actual realization of the, um, of the divine endowment or the divine gifts, you know, the sort of God complex. <laughs> and you know why it leads us away from it, my friend? Because the individuals who succumb, who submit to that sickness, to that grandiosity of the God complex are men who are terrified of the reality of the goddess and the divine feminine. And it's all about fear. The mm -hmm. God complex that obsesses people today who are trying to run the planet to ruin is driven by fear. And the basis of that fear is the fear of life. Wilhelm Wright pointed this out. They're afraid of life. They're afraid of love. They're afraid of tenderness. They're afraid of surrender. They're afraid of all the powers of the goddess that endow us with our divine potential. That's what they're afraid of. It's a fear-driven God glorification. That's what patriarchy is. And it's dying before our eyes. It's dying of, of its own disease. And those of us who can recognize that should rejoice and this is and recognize that this is the moment to claim back everything that they would deny us. It's a great, great moment. Mm -hmm. So these endowments, let me see if I can put them in a list. Okay? Yep. One of the basic teachings of Gnosticism has been, I believe, misrepresented by Gnostic scholars. Again, Gnostics did not teach that we are God, that we are divine in our identity. This is not correct. And as you know, I've tried to correct this error uh, in my book extensively and yeah. in my writings on Meta History World. Okay, so what did they teach? They taught that the human species is endowed, gifted with a divine potential. Doesn't mean that we are gods, but that the gods have given us a fragment or spark of their own divine energy. And this term for that divine energy, the divine spark that is endowed in our species is called NOUS, N-O-U-S. This is the operative term in Gnostic teachings. NOUS simply means intelligence. So if you were to ask me, as a reborn Gnostic and a revivalist 
of the Gnostic message. Are human beings wrong? Are we gods? I would say, no. That is not a correct conception. The conception is that we are the product of the divine imagination. We are the participants in the divine experiment. And what we have been given to allow us to engage in that experiment and carry it to its highest potential is use or intelligence. That is our primary endowment. And the Gnostics broke that endowment into six factors, five years, for this, an additional factor that I would add. And these factors, these elements or gifts of our endowment are all variations of the Gnostics of the Greek term Nous. The first one is metanoia, because noia is a derivation of the word Nous. I understand that. And noia is the basis of the word meletics. So the first gift is metanoia that we have. What is metanoia? Metanoia means beyond thinking. It means the ability to think beyond how you think now. One of the most beautiful expressions of metanoia seems to have come from Albert Einstein. Einstein said, and this is so brilliant and so Gnostic, you cannot solve a problem mm -hmm. in the same state of mind that it was created. <laughs> yep. You know? Mm -hmm. Right. For instance, the internal combustion engine, which burns, you know, gasoline, is a problem. You cannot solve that problem in the same state of mind in which it was created. Okay? So, mm -hmm. we have to go to, to other conceptions. We have to go to hydrogen. We have to go to water-driven engines. We have to go to other conceptions, other productions of our human intelligence to solve that problem. So metanoia is the capacity to change paradigms and to think a solution in a different envelope than the problem that we are trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Metanoia, we have that ability. Second capacity, there are five of them, is dianoia. Unfortunately, this word was co-opted by Scientology, which is called the said dianetics. I ask uh -huh. you to completely dismiss that association. Please bear with me. Dismiss that association. Dianetics has nothing to do with dianetics. What's dianoia? Well, it's what we're having right now. You and I are having dianoia. That is to say, dia means through. We're having a, a conversation back and forth through our intelligence. Dianoia is dialogue. It's intelligent, rational dialogue. It's the exploration of ideas and possibilities by two people, two or more people, mm -hmm. who leave the field of exploration open. We do not impose ideas. We do not force each other to think. You don't have to think what I think, and I don't have to think what you think. But through dianoia, we come to a resonance of understanding and communication. Fantastic gift of the human species. Yeah. No other animal has dianoia to the extent that we do. All other animal species communicate with each other, but we have a richness of dianoia. Third endowment, and this is really magnificent, epinoia, or as it is called in some of the Gnostic scripts, the luminous epinoia, translated. Mm -hmm. The luminous epinoia is imagination. Our imagination is a fantastic creative tool, but like any other tool, we have to learn to discipline it and use it correctly. As you know, a computer, like my beautiful Mac that I have in front of me here, is a tool. I can use this tool to write, create, communicate, explore, make art, communicate with people all around the world, or I can use it to do really stupid and ridiculous things and play games all day long. Likewise, epinoia, the divine endowment of imagination, is perhaps our most powerful tool that connects us with the goddess. And we, but we, need, we need to learn to use our imagination correctly 
mm-hmm. not just to imagination. Uh, I can't emphasize this too much. It's not just an anything goes proposition. It's not just anything that you fantasize in your imagination is okay. This is not correct. Imagination is a talent that requires, like musical talent or mathematical talent, a tremendous amount of discipline in sharing and comparison of results, comparison mm-hmm. of of uh, of uh, of our imaginative creation. So, so is that all clear so far? Yes, very much so. So we've got um, metanoia, dianoia, epinoia, the luminous epinoia. imagination, and particularly right. this um, idea that the imagination is perhaps one of our most powerful tools, but it's not just a matter of willy-nilly, you know, fantasizing. I mean, it's recognizing that it's a powerful tool, <laughs> so using it consciously and well. Is that right? That's right. That's right. And if we use it wrongly, and if we use it just for fantasy or self-indulgence or narcissism, uh, we're going to go really off the deep end with it. Imagination mm-hmm. is a tool that you don't want to misuse. And... Uh, Something I want to say that came to me lately under the uh, Kali Moon, uh, kind of uh, a warning or an instruction from the great Kali, which I would uh, convey to you in this manner. Use your imagination wisely and well, because mm-hmm. if you don't, somebody else will. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely the case. And and um, say just a, a, a little bit about that, John, because I, I mean, that to me is one thing that I know over the last two years um, came up with, it, it's kind of like increasing clarity. Uh, one was realizing just how easily the imagination, our imaginations are co-opted. And then also how we have been habitual, we become habitual in almost kind of a... Mm, sometimes a misuse, and I don't mean, you know, horrible, horrible things, although that can be part of it too, but, um, you know, in worry and, I mean, just all kinds of different ways we use our imagination that is not helpful and it's not productive and it's not constructive. So this to me is a really important um, idea. That's right. That's right. And what I would like to propose to you here, and I'm not going to elaborate on it, I'm just going to uh, offer it as a hint. If you would think of your, that your imagination functions like a compass. So here you have in your hand a compass, which has a dial with four directions on it, and it has a needle. And you know that when you look down at the compass dial, you see the needle fluctuate, it moves around, and then eventually it settles in a certain direction. This is the direction of mag- magnetic north. Okay? Mm-hmm. So I would propose to you, when you're listening to this discussion, that your imagination is like a compass. And I want to ask you, what's the magnetic north of your compass? Mm-hmm. You know? Now, to the extent that we're all living together as a human species on this planet, the magnetic north of everyone on this planet is the same. And the birds and the animals, birds follow paths of migration from the magnetic north to the magnetic south. These magnetic lines of orientation influence and guide the behaviors of many, many species, not just migrating birds, but many other species. And it's even shown that the magnetic orientation of the earth guides the development of omeba, of omebas and microscopic entities. So I would ask you to consider very closely what is the equivalent of a magnetic field and a magnetic north for the human imagination, because there is one. Mm-hmm. And when we all, as human beings, focus on that magnetic north, we align our desire bodies and our imaginations to the will of the wisdom goddess, and that is the highest empowerment of the human species. It's real. It's a high, true, real empowerment, and we can enact it, but without the alignment of imagination. Mm -hmm. The the compass needle of the imagination just fluctuating randomly from one thing to another. We don't have that alignment. So, if I could continue with the other two aspects of our endowment. Yes. Would that be... Okay. 
So we have the metanoia, changing paradigm, dianoia, the beauty of dialogue and sober, fair conversation, epanoia, power of imagination. The two remaining forces in this component, in this kind of toolkit, are ennoia, E-N-N-O-I-A. That's a very interesting word, ennoia, which occurs in Greek in the Gnostic texts. I would point out, by the way, that the Gnostic texts that I worked from were discovered in December 1945 in Egypt. Primarily, I use these. They're called the Nagamati texts. And they're written in Coptic, but they're based on Greek uh, language. So most of the technical language is Greek. Here we have a technical term in Gnosticism, ennoia, E-N-N-O-I-A. What does it mean? En means the direction of the focus. And noia means intelligence. So it means the direction or focus of intelligence. Ennoia means intention. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things about the human species is that we are intentional creatures. Other creatures like whales or bees or leopards or iguanas have an intention that they never question. They never have to make their intention conscious because Gaia has imprinted them with an unconscious intention and they follow faithfully that intention. And in that way, they make themselves cooperative with Gaia's design. So we have a latitude of freedom that the goddess gave us. We can align our intention to anything we like, anything we desire. And so it's so important to understand that this power of intention is our equivalent to instinct. And we must use it as a tool to align ourselves to Gaia and to the great design of this planet. Mm -hmm. Intention is tremendously important. Finally, comes the fifth uh, component of our design endowment, which is called enthemesis. And this word enthemesis is actually applied to Gaia herself, to Sophia. According to the Sophianic vision story of the mysteries, Sophia was a divine goddess, a divinity in the galactic center. And when the human experiment was conceived by the gods in the galactic center, they projected it collectively into the spiral arms of the galaxy. They projected their inoya, or their divine intention, into the spiral arms of our galaxy, and they seeded it in the galaxy so that this divine experiment originated in the core could unfold in many different human worlds and the human species would evolve in different worlds and develop this fantastic experiment of which we are one example one there are other human inhabited worlds and human-like experiments happening in our galaxy but we are one particular of those experiments and so the divine anoya of the gods produced this experiment. But then they say, and this is the fantastic uh, revelation of the Sophia myth, that the goddess Sophia, who was one of the divine artists or scientists in the galactic center, became so enthusiastic about this experiment that they had created that she wanted to come become involved in it. This is a fantastic story. This is a story of the creation of our Earth and the creation of the human species told, as you know, uh, in nine episodes in my book. Mm -hmm. So what happened is that her intimacy, her desire to participate in the experiment of humanity was so great that she actually fell this is the term they use metaphorically, mm -hmm. she right. fell from the galactic center into the outer limbs of the galaxy, the spiral arm, and she became involved physically and dynamically, bioenergetically, in the very experiment that she herself had set in motion. This is a fantastic story. Yeah. I have to tell you that I think you, you appreciate it. I think 
you have, are one of the people who has made the connection with how fantastic this story is and how unusual it is. It's, a, it's incredibly beautiful, actually. And this is another example that when, you know, I know even when I just heard you recount part of that part of the story, if you're, when we really open ourselves to it, we can, I mean, I can feel it in my body. I can, I can feel that. So um, that's what I mean where the, the, the myths or the stories really come alive in us because they connect um, within us that, knowing the sense of wisdom that is calling out to us. So, I mean, when I think of the of Sophia's great desire to be part of this experiment, and it was so intense, you know, this, this love, if you want to call it that, or this desire, this focus on um, participating, on being part of it, that she literally became part of it, you know, fell from the That's galactic right. center and became part of it. So is that the is that the um, the last of these uh, gifts that you were talking about? And, and recount for me, John, what the name was again. You'd mentioned Anoya, and then this okay. is so, our primary endowment is news. That is our intelligence. Right. You know, we don't have divine in our identity. We are certainly not divine in our egos and who we think we are in our self-conscious egos. Right. So we're divine in the, in the intelligence that we carry. And that intelligence has five permutations. Mm-hmm. Metanoia, which is paradigm change. Dianoia, which is dialogue and communication. Epanoia, which is imagination. Anoia, which is intention. And entomesis, which is desire. And desire is the factor that connects us mm-hmm. most closely to her. Beautiful. So um, that's actually, thank you for that, because that was a really beautiful um, walk through these different divine gifts, you know, the the variations of noose. And and, um, I think for listeners, too, I mean, the way you've approached it and um, gone through them, John, really begins to establish an awareness of um, just how... I'll say divinely thoughtful. Um, this all is this great experiment, which to me is always amazing. Again, the elegance of it fills me with awe. But um, but also we begin to see how we perhaps already do in some way use these gifts. We just may not be using them as consciously as we may wish to be using them. So that's the beauty, um, as I've heard you recount these. Um, in sharing these and in, in bringing attention to these different gifts or different parts of our endowment. And I want to uh, be, we're about 22 minutes left, and I want to um, also make sure that um, we move on to one of the other facets of our conversation before we begin, and that's another area that you've talked about as being so important um, as we look at reclaiming this wisdom, and that's the matter of gender balance and gender love. You know, in speaking uh, of some of the other uh, teachings, you've talked about the importance of these things, and I know um, you'd shared uh, the Consciousness of Nature essay series, and in that you wrote, we're not seeking a long-lost harmony, the recover of an androgynous ideal, which is something we hear about a lot. We're actually seeking a balance we never had in the first place. So what do you mean by this gender balance and gender love, and, and, you know, why is it part of this um, important heritage for us to reclaim at this uh, juncture, to reclaim and understand. Can you say something about that? Sure. You're absolutely right, Jamie, that we already are aware of the aspect of this endowment. We may not have, you know, we may not be able to make a concise inventory of them in that sense. Mm-hmm. We may not be able to specify what they are in the way that I just did. But every single human being has these qualities and talents percolating time. Mm-hmm. The question is, or the, the, the adventure is, understanding that we can bring these talents to a degree of infinite development, infinite development, which means that we can develop them with her, not by ourselves, mm-hmm. through the connection with the planetary goddess, to the divinity of the earth, can develop these five talents. 
to such an extent that life itself is that living is just an act of beauty. Living is a ritual of beauty. That every function, everything we need for the necessity of life and for survival comes to beauty and elegance, comes to the elaboration of these talents. Because obviously we're not doing that. Why not? Yeah. You know, what is holding us back? This is where the subject of sexuality really comes front and center to the picture. Um, I've used the term gender love. I think I might have introduced that term. I don't know. And uh, I can tell you that <laughs> as often happens when I come up with something like that, I don't exactly know what I mean in the beginning, you know. I just say, oh, it's kind of, you know, I kind of blurted it out, you know, oh, gender love, you know. And then, <laughs> in the process of interactivity with people and dialogue mm-hmm. and, and dianoia, it becomes obvious what I meant, you know, what I was talking about. <laughs> so, maybe in, in that perspective, I can say a little bit about gender love and why it's so important to all interactivity with the body. You know, um, in the history, men and women were completely equal, and they were, it was an egalitarian system where they experienced spiritual, uh, they engaged in spiritual experiments and practices together. And to that extent, I think the mysteries represent a kind of model for us of gender love. By gender love, what I mean is that you do not just love the, a woman. A man just does not love a woman, and a woman just does not love a man. Uh, that's the foundation. Let's start with that polarity. There are other gender variations, by the way. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not excluding under any gender variations of women loving women and men loving men. But let's just look at the essential polarity, the biological polarity, okay? Uh, mm-hmm. If a man loves a woman and a woman loves a man, they, you love that individual person. But gender love is a kind of transpersonal extension. It means that you don't just love that person, but you love the gender. You love the gender of womanhood. You love the gender of manhood. You know? mm-hmm. This is a quality of love that is based in our personal love experiences. It takes root in our actual love experiences with the men and women in our lives. It is carnal and emotional and existential but it grows into a higher kind of love, which is, I believe, the love that Sophia, the goddess, wants to see. And that is that women would love and respect and honor the gender of manhood, mm-hmm. and men would honor and respect and love the gender of womanhood. And we would understand that these two genders contributing together produce the fulfillment of human potential. These two genders together, harmonized together, supporting each other, produce the greatest and the best that human beings can do. And only through that harmonization can we realize this. That's why the figure of Mary Magdalene is so important. And that's why she was such a bombshell when she got delivered into the mainstream uh, some years ago by by the Da Vinci Code, as I'm sure you you realize. Absolutely, and before that, it seemed, that was just when it really seemed to just come splashing into the mainstream consciousness. That's when it hit the mainstream. Some of us were on to her uh, frequency before that. Why is Mary Magdalene so important? It's not because there's some particular special truth about Jesus and Magdalene, it's certainly not because they propagated a theocratic bloodline, which is Mm -hmm. an absolute lie. It's an absolute (laughs) lie. It's completely untrue. 
<laughs> it has nothing to do with gender love. Talk about it's a distraction, a John. That's what it occurs to Talk me when I do hear that. It's just like, it's who, it's a, who cares? That's a total distraction. Right. You know, that is a complete distraction. It's an insidious and deliberate attempt to lead us away from mm -hmm. what the true uh, love, the true, I call it the Gnostic romance. What is the Gnostic romance of Jesus and Mary Magdalene? Well, it's just a model of this tender love and this gender balance. And in that model, both the man and the woman, through their carnal and emotional involvement, elevate and support each other to their highest human potential. Why do you love someone? Do you ever ask yourself that question? Why? It's a really good question to ask because I think if you look into it deeply, you'll find that you love someone not only because they're lovable, which is, you know, fantastic to meet someone who's lovable, mm -hmm. but in a deeper sense, because you want to see them be who they really are. Absolutely. Love liberates us to be who we really are. This is the great secret of love. And so when you love someone, you not only liberate that individual to be who they truly are, but you participate in this great experiment of gender love in which the male gender and the female gender of our species, in whatever variation you want to make it, doesn't have to be strictly heterosexual, but heterosexual mm -hmm. is the basis of it, who is fair. The heterosexual dynamic is the basis of it. That dynamic is really essential to gendering, fostering, engendering, fostering, and promoting our two potential. So we've got to stop these wars between the sexes. We've got to stop these insidious games, this jealousy, this using each other, this manipulation, this sexualism. We've got to stop it. And there is the design element in sexuality. And I believe that we can come to it when we, men and women, come together in the understanding of the goddess. We come into that design sexual mystery. Mm -hmm. Well, that, you know, it's almost like it's another part of the um, the false desire overlays or implants, I'll call them, because, you know, we receive them through advertising and marketing and a host of other things, kind of in, little implants of what we should desire, how we should desire, what love is, how that um, unfolds in relationships. So there's the sort of distorted view, you know, <laughs> this sort of television sort of thing. And um, it, it, it occurs to me, and it's occurred to me, it's, this has been a real fire for a couple of years, this whole idea of sacred relationship or gender love or um, sure. that, you know, the, the idea of liberating the highest potential in one another and sometimes doing that by reflecting back or mirroring, mirroring what is not, you know, so we can clear and release that. Um, and this whole notion that the two together create what um, so Bantu Somme in the Dagara culture called the spirit of the relationship, something that together becomes more than either one gift the community with individually. And, you know, right. again, this is one of those things, John, that in hearing this and understanding this and in um, considering this as a possibility or potential, it completely opens how we might see and approach our relationships in a much less superficial, embattled way, um, and in a much instead in a much richer and evolutionary way. Totally, totally. It is really the breakthrough. This gender love is really the breakthrough, and there is an enormous amount of distortion about it. A distortion about the relation between the sexes and how we should treat each other, and mm -hmm. that again ties into the distortions of our desire. But these distortions are what the, the Gnostics were, were very aware of, and they call them the archotic factor. That mm -hmm. is, uh, giving you an imitation, an imitation and a false version of something when you can have the real thing. That's basically what archotic reality is. It's, a, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's like having, uh, you know, sweet and low when you can have honey. Yeah. <laughs> that's a that's actually a beautiful a beautiful metaphor a beautiful example because it's so different 
you know, that horrifying yeah. synthetic sweetener and this amazing, That's rich, right. natural substance, yeah. Which is a healer and an aphrodisiac, and anything you can put on it is what it, you know, in honey is fantastic. So why are you, why are you eating sweet and low? You know, that's the problem. There's so much distortion, but I tell you that when you are attracted to another human being, man to woman, man to man, woman to woman, whatever, and you find that in that attraction, the discovery of love, the power of discovery, this is a sacred, sacred power. And she counts on us for this. She counts on men and women and couples of whatever kind coming together into her mystery and her magic. I assure you, she counts on us for that. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's incredibly beautiful. We've got about nine minutes, and we can okay. talk a little bit more about this. You, we can um, move through and talk about facing the world now, because I know that you know these remaining minutes will go really quickly, and I want to make sure people again hear where they can find more about you, um, etc. So, what do you think, mm-hmm. John? How should we? Uh, how should we use the remaining let's, precious moments? Well, let's see if these nine and eight minutes, if I can uh, summarize and synthesize the message of the mysteries as I understand it. Go back to our initial emoya, to our initial intent. Mm-hmm. Mysteries are important primarily for two things that they show us. First is that they show us that the most powerful technology on this planet is body-mind technology. Mm -hmm. The most sophisticated instrument of higher communication is your own body. Sexuality is an aspect. Tantric sexuality is an aspect of the mystery of the body and the awakening of the powers within the body. All of the mystery school teachers, the seers, the shamans, men and women of that great tradition, use their bodies they were aware of the seven chakra system, 13 actually, 16, whatever you want to, how would you want to play it. They were aware of how the body connects us to the magnetic field of the earth, how the iron in your blood, which is the physical correlate of your desire, grounds you into the iron magnetic, iron attracting magnetic field of the earth. They were aware of the biodynamics of the, the human body and the psychodynamics of the mind, and we are rediscovering this today. This is mm-hmm. the way we will face the problems in the world, through the rediscovery of the sacred technology of our bodies. The second point that the mysteries have to offer us, the second point of orientation, is so crucial, is a vision story for humanity. I'm sure that you know, and many of people listening to this, and who will listen to this conversation, are aware of the idea of a vision quest. Mm-hmm. All indigenous societies, from the American Indians, the Eskimos, the Aborigines of Australia, the Polynesians, the natives of the Ural Mountains of Siberia, all around the world, all indigenous societies had in common this ritual that a young person, man and woman, reaching the age of puberty, when they would become a responsible member of society, would go on a vision quest. You can read about this, Google it. There are many beautiful stories of vision quests. People today are having vision quests, with and without use of psychoactive plants. And what is so fantastic about the tradition of the mysteries is that they are not a thing of the past. They don't have to go to the past because they have transmitted to the present the possibility of a vision quest for our species. And every single human being who goes on this vision quest for the species will come to the same vision. And that is the story of the divine Sophia the origination of the human experiment in the galactic center, Mm -hmm. the origination of the human genome. This story is the vision quest of our species, and it unites us imaginatively. You know, to be united imaginatively is a fantastic and magical adventure. 
Mm-hmm. Because it means that people who don't even ever meet each other physically, like you and I, Jamie, have ever met, we have the possibility to explore and implement our imaginations in any way you like. You would do it in your way. I would do it in my way. We would do it in many, many different ways. But there is one way that you will do it in the karma. That's the whole secret. The whole secret of the power of imagination in our species is that we have a touchstone. We have a common vision that guides the species, and that is her story. And though the mysteries were destroyed, they can never be reconstructed in the fashion that they existed in the past. Mm-hmm. The story survives. The story survives, and this story is our endowment. Mm-hmm. Incredibly beautiful, John. Uh, thank you so much for that. And so, you know, as um, people have listened to this amazing conversation and the richness that you've shared um, and want to delve uh, more deeply or reacquaint more deeply, where can they, um, what would you suggest uh, in terms of, of um, where they should go for more information or next steps? Well, as you know, my book, Not His Image, is the reconstruction of the Sophia myth, and it describes what actually happens in the mysteries, including the encounter with the organic light, which is a, the substance body of the goddess, something that we might discuss at a future time. So if you want to go and get that perspective, read Not in His Image, and you'll find in the end of the book, on suggested reading and research, a great uh, number of books to pursue, which I've very carefully selected uh, in order to orient uh, toward this sublime adventure of the human experiment, particularly uh, people like Wilhelm Wright, who is incredibly important. Uh, you know, there are many, many things you can read, but in the suggested reading and research, I kind of define some directions of research. But apart from that, Take a look at metahistory.org and uh, look at the site map, take a tour of the site, and uh, see what catches your attention. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, there's, there's a wealth of um, resources at metahistory.org. And, um, and again, Not in His Image is a fantastic, um, oh, yeah, it's, it's so much more than an introduction or um, bringing you into a greater depth. So, you know, read it for yourselves, dear readers and dear, dear listeners. And um, thank you again, John. It's such a pleasure to talk with you. I really appreciate that you um, joined me again today. Well, I've enjoyed it so much, and uh, I feel a lot of clarity uh, and affection in our dianoia, as it were. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's it, yeah. And, and to all who are listening, uh, whether live or if you're listening into the archives, thank you for your presence, and thank you for your intention and attention and um, for your willingness to open up uh, into this um, great sublime adventure, as John said. Uh, you find out more about some um, upcoming Feminine Mojo shows and other Feminine Mojo projects, including some of the things that we'll be exploring, similar to what we've been talking about in the Feminine Mojo Mystery School and other parts of the Feminine Mojo projects. You can find more about that at www.ivysea.com. You'll find the Sophia's Children's blog and um, other manner of things, and including uh, some blog entries on John's book, Not in His Image. So thank you again for listening, everyone. I wish you very well as we wander into 2011 and as we enliven some of these very gifts that we've been talking about today and bring them much more consciously and um, lovingly and with that great Sophia desire into this um, world that we're living in. Thanks again, everyone. Weird in the the so-called dark feminine. That's right. And uh, I would say that the, the, in so far as we look at the situation of the world today, and we look at the things that are wrong, and the things that are deliberately uh, made to go wrong. Mm-hmm. By the way, you know the orchestration of deception yeah. and control. It's all coming from a paternal and patriarchal viewpoint that is terrified of the feminine. Mm-hmm. Terrified. 
And those of us who reconnect with the divine goddess and Gaia and the mother, who is Mother Earth, Sophia, as the Gnostic culture, of course we recognize her nurturing qualities. Of course we recognize that she gives life and sustains life. But at the same time, Jamie, there is that factor of mm -hmm. yoga, the invincible, the ferocious, and this is the Kali factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a really rich myth, and it's um, definitely one of the ones that I explore pretty regularly because as we were talking about just before we started the show, John, both of us <laughs> seem uh, fairly well um, acquainted with Kali, or at least Kali has made sure that we're well acquainted with her and in conversation with her under various yes, degrees. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, so, and it is a really rich, rich story. But the whole point of these stories, as we'll and we'll be talking about some of them um, in just a few moments. But it's not just sort of uh, an exercise in entertainment, you know. Or I forget what I recently saw, kind of a a term for spiritual entertainment, but kind of spiritainment. But it, it really is as we explore or re-explore these stories, as we lift off the, um, the kind of patriarchal distortion or patriarchal overlay, we begin to find our way back. You know, it's almost like ancient tributaries meandering back, and, and it really does activate a type of cellular or ancestral or what is it, analeptic memory um, of, of some of this deeper wisdom. So it's, it seems to me both really enjoyable, it's a joyful pursuit to reacquaint with these stories, to immerse in them and, and explore them, but it also um, continually amazes me at what it awakens. You know, just... And so to a certain extent, those of us who follow the way of Gaia and of the goddess must become warriors to establish that true way of life. It's a warrior calling. And Kali... But how would I define her to you in, in a simple phrase, from my understanding? <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes things are so intimate that it's difficult to speak of them. Um, and this is certainly how I feel about my connection with Kali. Mm -hmm. Yes, she doesn't. Uh, many of these things don't lend themselves well to that 30 second elevator blurb we've <laughs> been so accustomed to with just a sound no, they bite. Don't. So. They don't. But at the same time, it is important to be clear and to be coaching in, in how we communicate about these things. So I'd like to say that for those of you who are drawn toward the divine feminine, those of you who recognize that the presence of the earth, the presence, of the earth is a divine, super intelligent, super animating organism. With recognizing Kali, kind of the immunological system of that organism. So I might use that metaphor. Mm -hmm. This is why she is called the highest of all protectors. She's a great, great protector of those who would now return to Gaia and who would now enjoy and celebrate and explore and enact the mysteries of our divine potential. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because as I've been listening, I, it just occurred to me that I think it was January 12th to the 19th, so this would be the last day of um, one of the festivals in India um, for... Parvati, which sometimes is um, talked of as being just another name or face of Kali and Durga. So still, you know, it's re it really is talking about that fierce feminine aspect that can hold the, um, the intense desire and loving and creativity with that kind of fierceness that probably has long been... Greetings, everyone, and once again, happy 2011. Welcome to the Feminine Mojo Show here on Blog Talk Radio. I'm your host, Jamie Walters. I'm an author and the creatrix of IVC and the Feminine Mojo Projects. You'll find more information and inspiration on the Feminine Mojo Projects, of which this Blog Talk Radio Show is one, but not the only one. And you'll find information on how you can use and work with the Feminine Mojo Projects or participate and reclaim your own feminine mojo 
Learn more about that and more at IVYSEA.com, and I'll tell you more about that later as well. As we continue into 2011, this new calendar year anyway that we've just begun, and every day is a new start as we know, every moment is a new start potentially to change our minds, to change our hearts, but since we've just started a new calendar year, we'll work with it so that as we've started this 2011 year, we'll, and as we look forward, we'll have continued opportunities to navigate change and transformation. And the coming year also offers some amazing possibilities, as all days and all years do, and some more than others, to align with the wisdom and power of our hearts and the deep, deep wisdom we have access to. So it's even more important for each one of us to be in strong relationship with the feminine and the deep wisdom that's been too long forgotten. And that's, uh, among other things, what the Feminine Mojo Projects have been conceived for, as a contribution for, as a vessel for. Join me in the Feminine Mojo Mystery School, another of the Feminine Mojo projects, to explore the feminine more deeply if you choose, if you feel comfortable. Over the coming year, we'll explore powerful feminine and goddess stories and archetypes and the seven gates of Inanna, which provide one journey map of initiation and transformation. You'll find that and other Feminine Mojo resources, again, at IVYSEA.com. Now, for today's Feminine Mojos, inspired dialogue. John Lamb uh, joins me again. We talked a couple of weeks ago, and today we'll be talking about the return of Sophia, the great goddess, and why the wisdom from the ancient mystery schools is so important to us right now. In today's conversation, we'll explore the role of desire, our divine endowment, gender balance, and gender love, and the organic light that some of the ancient mystery teachers were very familiar with. And we've been kind of uh, distracted a little bit from that. Through these constellations, that the sky represents a kind of code through which we can read the intentions and activities of divine entities. Of course, this is a very ancient idea. But what I find wonderful and exciting is that we can rediscover and apply this idea in our time. Mm -hmm. I have attempted to do this to a great extent as you know, through my website and through the years I've also, I guess you could say, tutored and mentored people in observation of the real sky. For instance, observation of the crescent moon uh, mm -hmm. each month. And to connect yourself in will and intention and in desire and love with those cycles, especially the lunar cycles, is a way to become integrated into the divine mysteries of the universe and to a way also to discover and uh, activate, act, actualize our own divine endowment. Mm -hmm. So I've taught a great deal about these lunar cycles and I just want to say that consequent of the previous new moon uh, of about two weeks ago that precedes the full moon, uh, we are in the full moon of Kali of Kali, Mahakali, or Kali Ma. And this is a, an aspect of the divine feminine that can be viewed as having a really important role today in what we are facing in the world. Mm -hmm. Those of us who would like to, to reconnect with Gaia and who feel the, the longing, and the powerful, powerful longing, I, I don't know of a better word for it, the, the craving, to reconnect with the matrix of the life force, mm -hmm. you know, are also aware, acutely aware, that there is something wrong in our world and that the way that human society lives on the planetary level is not in accord with the life force of the divine goddess. So we find ourselves in some respect, in a, we may find ourselves on the planet today in a conflictual situation. That is to say that the earth is not a safe and happy place as we would like it to be. Part of our endowment and that part of our history. We'll also learn how Mary Magdalene fits into this picture. So listen in and it'll be a great conversation. We'll be talking for about 90 minutes this time. We've got a lot to share. So settle in, sit back, pour yourself a cup of tea if you haven't already and um, join us. John Lamb Lash is the author of one of my favorite books, as I mentioned last time and I've mentioned on my blog, Not in His Image, Gnostic Vision, Sacred Ecology, and the Future of Belief. 
If you followed my Sophia's Children blog or listened to the recent conversation with John on the most recent Feminine Mojo show, you'll know this is a must-read book. And um, I've read it several times. I refer back to it several times. My copy, at least the working copy, is dog-eared and underlined. So um, you'll also find John on Sophia returning the Path to Planetary Tantra DVD, and you'll find that at sacredmysteries.com. John Lash is often called the the true successor of Marcia Eliade and the rightful heir of Joseph Campbell. He's a self-educated independent scholar who combines studies and experimental mysticism to teach directive mythology. That is, as he says, the application of myth to life rather than its mere in interpretation. He's also authored The Seeker's Handbook, Twins and the Double, The Hero, Manhood and Power, and Quest for the Zodiac. You'll find more about John Lamlash at his website, metahistory.org. Welcome back to the Feminine Mojo Show, John. Well, thank you, Jamie. It's a beautiful introduction. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, there's, you know, there's a lot to work with, and that's always really wonderful. So before we, we dive into the mysteries, or uh, this is actually kind of a part of it, um, because certainly reacquainting ourselves with the cycles and rhythms of nature and the goddess archetypes is um, so much part of the rich heritage that we're reclaiming. But uh, today you would mentioned is the, the full moon of Kali, where we're connecting and talking and having this conversation on the day of the full moon in Cancer in Western astrology. But you would talked about it being the full moon of Kali and the most magical full moon of the year. That sounds delightful. Can you uh, speak a little bit more about that and share it with our listeners? Certainly, I'd be delighted. My understanding to the study of the sky for many years, to the study of the real sky constellations, the observable sky, and the patterns of the moon and planets, 